Welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast, created for those currently going through our operator training course and for others who are interested in thinking about joining the organization in future years. In this podcast, we're going to be bringing you some highly successful operators, leaders, and training specialists who are going to be revealing their tips, tools, and some techniques to help you achieve peak levels of performance. Now, sit back, take some notes, and use these experiences as stepping stones for your personal success. This is the Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, welcome back to the Insight to Experience podcast, everybody. I'm really excited about this week. Hopefully you are too, because we have our sports psychologist, Dr. Ben Wellborn, with us this week. We've been lucky to have Ben over the past few years as a sports psychologist. He comes in and just, he teaches us and gives us the knowledge on how to train the mental side of performance. Uh, I used to ask questions during our peak performance courses and other places to the operators of if you're in a very stressful combat situation, which are you relying on more, mental or physical? And I'd make them put a percentage out of 100% that have to assign both of those aspects, you know, a certain percentage. Uh, the main out of all of those, the average is usually about 80% mental, 20% physical. Um, and that's telling, because then you say, raise your hand if you train your mental side as hard as you train the physical side, and then not one hand goes up. So I think that's what this podcast is going to offer today. We have a mental performance specialist giving us a whole lot of good answers about how to prep for upcoming hard things, how to do a daily battle rhythm that will support better mental performance, and then other certain simple things like how do I stay present in the moment when I'm performing, and how do I pull myself out of a fatal funnel if things aren't going my way how do i pull myself out of that um, to find success again so this will be a very valuable episode hopefully for all you out there it was for me so sit back grab that notebook take some notes and enjoy this episode of insight to experience podcast thanks for coming with us good afternoon ben how are you Ah, uh, good good it is a good afternoon um, we are going to start. We'd like to give the audience a little bit about your uh, background, some education, maybe some of your experience, and how you ended up here with us at the 724. Got it. Um, so I'll start backwards then. So currently at the 724, and uh, I've been doing the sports psychology work here for just over two years now. And uh, prior to that, I was um, at SWIC, JFK SWIC on the Army side working in. Uh, the various uh, pipelines there, CA, PSYOP, SF, a um, little bit with uh, third group um, on the operational side as well. And uh, just doing you know a lot of the same types of things there that I am here, but just obviously in a different way because it's all pipeline. It's all education based for the most part. And here I do a little bit of uh, both. I'll do education um, and application types of training and training support, especially for like OTC. Um, but then here I'll, I'm also involved in um assessment um, not so much the selection part but the the assessment uh, piece if you will and uh, so I do a couple different things that I, I did not do over on the army side and then uh, prior to that I got my PhD at the University of South Carolina and uh, I was looking to find out how I can apply what I do in the in the military realm and this became the kind of the route I, I took and I think it's been a great route. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't really want to be doing anything else at this point in time. So happy to be where I'm at. Yeah. What got you into sports psychology though? Cause not a weird career field. I don't think for me, it interests the crap out of me, but sure. honestly, when we heard we were getting a sports site, not one of us knew what it meant. So sure. How did, how did you find out and what drew you there? Right. So uh, college baseball uh, is basically what got me here. I played uh, college baseball at Appalachian state and I was one of those athletes that you know, I had a piece of my game that just was not up to par, uh, and that was hitting, which is pretty important <laughs> if you want to go onto the professional level. And uh, but defensively, I was fine. I was a catcher, and you know, had probably everything I needed uh, from a de- defensive standpoint to to pursue a, a career on the next level. But I just was not very good at hitting. Uh, but uh, it was also there that I realized that it was more of a mental aspect that was holding me back as opposed to a physical aspect. I, how how, and, how did you figure that out? Uh, base, basically because I would spend hours in a cage with the hitting coach working on technique and 
uh, then I would go to a game and I would perform basically the same. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, I'm spending all this time working on my physical game, uh, the technique, um, primarily uh, video review, all of these different things to focus on improving physical aspects. Uh, but when I get to a game, it's the same outcome. And so I think that was one of the things. And then other things, I had two very distinctive points in time where uh, basically I had someone direct me um, from an instructional standpoint that freed up my mind. So uh, when I was able to execute, when I knew that my mind was not focused on you know something mechanical, something physical in nature, I performed a whole lot better. So, and I performed really, really well. And uh, at the, those points, so I knew I could do it. Um, I just did not consistently do that. And so to me, that, that's a mental holdup right there. And so uh, because of that, I always wanted to, to explore the field a little bit more find out as much as I, I could so that from a athletic perspective, I could improve my performance. But then I also got into coaching and I was always looking for ways that I can improve, improve the players that I was coaching their own field performance, um, as well as accelerate, you know, the process. Uh, in other words, how could I get done in two hours? What really we probably needed four hours to get done, um, mainly because I, I was restricted based on time constraints at that point. So a lot of different reasons, I think, but it's all tied up into that idea that the, the physical uh, realm was not getting me everything I desired, basically. So, Did you say you were a catcher? <clears throat> I was, yeah. Uh, so that strikes me. You, I can see it now that you say it, but I wouldn't have predicted it. Oh, yeah. No, nope. um, I was a catcher, for sure. But what I love about being a catcher, and I think bodes well for you, is the strategy and the complete awareness of the game that that position has to have. Right. That's, yeah. How did that play into your search for mastery or your search for, like Damn. that, and and then you pulled yourself out of it. like you realized, hey, this probably isn't going to be reality, but it's leading me to other places. Sure, it'd be hard for me, I think, and I'll shut up so you can answer. But I'm a catcher man, and I am like I know everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm probably calling some pitches because I understand the hitter that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. How does all that translate into what you're doing today? Well, so I think, you know, with catching, uh, you, you make a lot of decisions, you know, throughout a game, right? And so um, I'm making decisions for myself, but I was also making decisions for my pitcher, right? To, to really decrease his mental workload, right? So if he can trust me to call a good game uh, so that he can just focus strictly on executing the pitch, uh, then that reduces his mental workload. Uh, and theoretically reduces his physical workload too because we know that mental fatigue impacts physical performance, right? And so I think that right there is probably what I try to take into my job every day. You know, my job, I think here, one of my biggest jobs is, or actually the biggest job is performance enhancement. That's my primary role here. And so I'm always looking for anything in the research, anything from the application side, um, best practices, all of those those different things to basically help our guys here reduce their mental workload so that they can handle more things, so that they can do what they're doing to the to the highest ability level. And it was the same thing whenever I was catching, to be honest. So if I were to make those that tie, I think that's how I would do it. Yeah, when you said catching, all those things that you just said started just exploding in my mind a little bit of, man, that just relates so well to what you do now. Because honestly, you're coaching from behind the plate and you're an active player at the same time. Exactly. Unique unique position right. so i know you did some time at swick but how about your arrival at the 724 what has struck out to you or stuck out to you about your uh time here so far you know the biggest thing uh, that i think differences if you want to call them differences if you will of being here compared to somewhere else um the people are absolutely the uh the, the best i think they're the best in the business and uh, i think that on both the operational level, but I also think that on the support level, um, you, I haven't come into contact with a person yet that's not at a probably at the highest, one of the highest levels they can get to, um, or pretty close to the highest level they can get to in their given domain. And I think the 724 demands that um, based on its uh, unique requirements and what guys are being trained to do and asked to do. And so um, I, I think is I've got to come back to the people on that. So moving to selection a little bit, and I know we're kind of moving fast, but I think all this is going to tie back into itself eventually. But you've witnessed and been involved with several of our selection processes so far. What has stuck out to you about the candidates that are 
that are arriving and going through our selection process. Yeah, the prob- probably the wide variety of folks. Um, I've thought about it quite a bit, actually, and I, and I would say the, the variety from uh, experience levels to personality to just overall talent, if you will. Um, and what I mean by that is there's, there's all so diverse now, and there's not a cookie-cutter version, um, if you will, or an exact script of what is uh, being looked for. Um, so I think that's the, the biggest thing that, that's stood out about the folks who are coming through selection. And then I think also the, the – I think you can always come back to the determination. I mean, you know, guys, when they come to selection here, they are – they're all determined, right? They, they want to, to be here. And it's interesting to see how the selection process um, reveals that even more so in some and less in others, to be honest. And so, because uh, I do think it's a very challenging process, uh, both uh, physically, um, as, as most people probably know, as it should be. And, but it's also a very psychologically demanding arena as well. And when you fuse those two together, then... Uh, I think it, it reveals all these these things uh, from a from different viewpoints, if you will. So, but I think I would come back to the idea that the the biggest thing I've seen is just a wide variety of folks coming through. You're talking about how physically, and mentally demanding it is. You being in your profession as a sports psychologist, and you seeing the you know, what the guys are going to have to go through when they get here. What advice would you give to them besides I mean, what's on the website is valuable, but, man, we have live Dr. Wellborn sitting here with us today. So what, <laughs> what's some advice you would give the guys before they come up? So I'll start generally. Like, if I were to give you guidance, and this came out of the last election. You know, we were in, you know, one of the, the very beginning brief, if you will, and we asked guys who physically prepared for this. And, of course, everybody raises their hands, right? And then we asked the question, well, who mentally prepared for this? And I want to say roughly 30-ish, maybe 35% of that group, you know, raised their hands. And so I think people put a lot less emphasis on training mentally, mainly because I I think people just don't know how to do it. And I think people just don't know exactly what would constitute, hey, what what is mental training? Like, what what does that even look like? So generally speaking, if I offered guidance to anybody, um, I'd I'd start off and I would say uh, read right? So read books. It's very general. Um, it, it may sound like common sense, but if, if you go to Amazon or you go to a bookstore, there are so many different books out there now written on the mental and psychological um, perspective of improving your performance, um, accelerating your ability to learn, all of these other topics um, that I'll hit on uh, once you get here. Uh, and they provide essentially a, a good solid framework um, or a good solid Uh, description of all of the or most of the various mental skills out there if you will and so and when I say mental skills I'm talking you know stuff like you know self-talk so those strategies to enhance your 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 ability to concentrate and to shift your attention effectively talking about visualization uh, goal setting uh, and some kind of relaxation uh, technique if you will we teach a lot of diaphragmatic breathing and we use some heart rate variability biofeedback to, to train that up uh, but essentially, it's that tactical pause that you're going to take. And, but the, the ones I just referred to, those are referred to as the big four, um, if you will. And you can find descriptions and, and uh, a variety of ways to apply those in, in most of those books that are out there, just generally speaking. Uh, the ones that I typically recommend from a book standpoint, I, I really like How Champions Think. Uh, he goes in good detail about how can you think when you're supposed to think, but then not think and overthink situations so that you can be a better decision maker. So I really like that aspect of, of his work. Uh, Deep Survival is a really good read uh, that's re- uh, written by a survival specialist, um, but has direct application for what guys will be doing once they come to selection. Uh, the books uh, Peak Performance and The Champion's Mind um, are two others that are going to go into some of those mental skills that I talked about. And uh, those are Peak Performance is a little bit more general. Uh, Champion's Mind is a little bit more sport focused, but really they cover the same concepts and uh, all of those concepts are directly applicable in this uh, environment. Other things that that I would recommend, you know, definitely get with your local operational psychologist. They have a lot of information that they can offer, um, skills, techniques, training in some of these areas as well. 
and I think they would. Uh, you, you need to go ahead and get uh, with that person and uh, talk to them about you know what you feel like some of your weaknesses are, and if you don't know what your weaknesses are, get with them to to get them to help you figure out that so that you can start improving on some of those things um, while you continually try to focus and improve your uh, strong points um, because you want those to be as uh, honed in on and as, as strong as possible when you get here. Those are some of the general things that I would I would say. The other things that, that I think we do a lot of here, we try to integrate the, the mental and physical training as much as possible. And there are so many different ways that you can do that. Uh, the, the big four that I just talked about, those can all be integrated very seamlessly into your strength and conditioning sessions as well as any rocking that you're doing or, or any other physical preparation. Um, I think that uh, if you will make a conscious effort to not separate mental and physical, that you're going to be more prepared uh, than if you were to separate them. Uh, but if you do choose to separate them, which you'll do that at some point, um, that, I mean, that, that's fine too. Uh, it's just that I, I think too often we separate mental from physical when we don't really have to we don't you don't do that in your operational training so it shouldn't happen anywhere else really yeah, that's a great point just by you saying that i i think i do that too much even in my own life right now to me those seem like two separate processes when honestly they're so in intertwined it's you can't separate them you can't separate them you can't um let's dive into a little more specificity if you will mm-hmm. so Ben is 30 days out from selection, and mm-hmm. the guys who we're mm-hmm. about to send the reporting instructions out to in the morning, yep. that's pretty much where they're at. Knowing what you know about our process and knowing what you're an expert at, yeah. what has Ben doing over the next 30 days before he shows up here? Gotcha. So, yeah, I'll get very specific here. Uh, just a, a generalized preparation plan, 30 days out. Uh, this will be very specific for a for one day, but then this would be the same process I would use essentially every day, but I would start off, I'd I'd get up and the first thing I'm doing in the morning is I'm gonna read. Um, That's when we are mentally and psychologically the freshest and we have the ability at that point in time to take new information, bring it in, and uh, then we can also use the rest of the day to begin applying that. So start by reading and set aside, you know, whatever you can do at the time, but you know, ideally 30 minutes at, at least, if you can, ideally an hour, to be perfectly honest, an hour would be great, but 30 minutes to an hour. And this is where I would read some of the material focused on that mental preparation we just talked about, right? That way you can get some of those things into your brain early in the morning. And then you can also, uh, there again, back to the, uh, the, uh, what I mentioned before, start applying them throughout the day because you can read something and then not apply it. And if you don't apply it pretty much right away in some capacity, you're probably going to forget about it pretty quick. After that, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, get in the car and I'm going to go to my unit, um, and, I'm going to get my workout in and before I, I get out of the car, once I get there, I'm going to engage in approximately five minutes of diaphragmatic breathing. I'm going to breathe at a rate of approximately four to seven breaths per minute. Okay. Uh, we all have uh, what's called our resonance frequency. I'm not going to go into that right now, but that lies within four to seven breaths per minute and it provides us the greatest opportunity to relax our system and condition our rest and digest response, which is going to be uh, very beneficial if you will condition that. Um, every day uh, so that when you get here that system that rust and digest phase um, or system is just as conditioned to respond effectively as your fight or flight response which you know when you go to the gym and you do sled pushes and you do um, your carries and you do all this other stuff you're training your sympathetic side primarily Uh, the goal with the the breathing at that point in time is just to get that uh, parasympathetic side to to be conditioned to respond effectively as well then I'm going to go in and get going to get my workout in. <clears throat> and during my workout, I'm going to make a uh, deliberate effort to apply some of the techniques that I learned from my reading that morning, whether it's goal setting, visualization, um, some self-talk, um, if you will, and uh, just the simple idea of, of staying in the present moment, uh, whether you call it mindfulness or just you know a present moment focus, but I want to be in that present moment and I want to practice that aspect. Uh, especially while I'm uh, in the gym, but then, you know, more importantly, just throughout my day, because you can practice that skill at any point in time. You don't have to have a a dedicated session for it. Let's break Um, that down real quick, Ben. So you're in the gym. Let's say I'm about to do some deadlifts. Uh, Give me an example of a guy who isn't 
able to stay present, maybe not even thinking about it, maybe not even realizing what does that look yeah. like? And then how, what are some cues or what are some things they can do to pull themselves back in? So uh, the guy who's not in the present moment is the guy who is um, overly concerned about the other guys around him. Um, and um, if you're uh, do, if you're all doing deadlifts, you're too focused on what everybody else is doing weight-wise compared to yourself, right? That's one example. Um, another example is maybe you're trying to hit a uh, PR and uh, you look down at the weight and you're like, oh man, there's no way I'm getting this. Not a good place to be, right? Um, so it's, that's negative self-talk. You're, you're out of the present moment. You're too focused really on uh, the outcome at that point in time. Um, and you, um, you have a lot of self-doubt and self-judgment going on. So that's not present moment, okay? The alternative would be, um, in terms of the present moment, would be, okay, what is a, for example, what's a keyword or um, where does my attention need to be to maximize my ability to lift that weight, right? And so to do that, you, you probably have your own technique that you're using for that. And what I mean by technique is you're, your own way to execute that technique, right? And so if you've done your, you know, preparation well, you, you probably have set things that will enable you to do that better, whether it's, you know, drive your feet into the ground or whether it's, hey, I want to jump through the roof, whatever, whatever it is that's going to help you actually execute that task. And so that's, a, that's really the difference there. Um, it's really the idea that we're, we're focused on something that's going to help us to do the, the task at hand, and we're not being um, focused on the, the present, or I'm sorry, on the uh, past or the future, um, and, and being judgmental, too judgmental of ourselves at that point in time. D- does that, is that good on the description? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. That's great. Good example. So that's how I'm applying, for example, that skill during a, a lift um, after I, I finish up my workout, then I'm going to re-engage in, you know, three to five minutes of diaphragmatic breathing, because what I really want to do in that 10 minutes after my workout is to try to get really, really good heart rate recovery. And by engaging in that breathing again, I'll put it in a really good place to help my body do that. Uh, I'm getting the practice of conditioning my parasympathetic system. And Theoretically, hopefully, it's going to help me re- uh, recover for my next workout uh, the next day or even if I'm in a two-a-day situation, maybe for that, that afternoon. During your workout, if you have access to a heart rate monitor, I would also suggest using a heart rate monitor. I, I think that provides great self-awareness. It's not the end-all, be-all, but I, I do like the, the feedback in the moment. And uh, one of the things I, I like that we do here, sometimes it's, it's a simple conditioning task where John, one of our strength coaches, he has a guy running at seven or 10 seconds um, on the curve and they sprint as fast as they can. And then they're hooked up live on the heart rate monitor and they can't uh, do their next sprint until their heart rate gets back down to around like 135. And as you, he has them typically do like 10 or 12 of those. And as you continue to progress and your heart rate gets higher after each one, it gets harder and harder to deactivate back down to 135. And a lot of times guys will, we have, we have guys that like to run high all the time. Like they like to jack their heart rates up and just stay high and they perform really well, right? The, the, uh, the, the argument's not that you're not gonna perform well. The challenge here is to use some kind of control mechanism, attention control to, to focus in on breath rate at this point in time and then use that breath rate to decelerate your heart rate, which is a totally different challenge. And then the goal really is, you know, do it, you know, once a week and then challenge yourself to complete those 10 or 12 reps in the least amount of time possible. Because if you do it in the least amount of time possible, what that's probably telling you is that you've increased your ability to decelerate your heart rate between runs. What's that doing for you physically or physiologically um, when you decrease that? So I think it's um, helping your, a couple things, right? I think it's uh, just helping your system uh, rest and relax when a lot of times in those activities we we don't do that right and what i think that allows you to do is to manage your energy levels more effectively and if you can condition your system to do that and what i mean by condition in this and this uh at this point in time is you can ramp it up when you need to ramp it up but you can uh, bring it back down when you need to bring it back down And then what I think that'll help you do is when you get to an area like selection or to some kind of operational training you're preparing for that demands 
that you ramp it up at certain points in time and that you are effective also at coming back down, that your system is better acclimated to doing that. And so I think it's just a simple, easy training task that you can build in that has some pretty good transfer for your overall system. After that, I, I'm going to definitely, uh, before I leave the gym, I've done my, my breathing after the workout, then I'm definitely going to make sure that I am uh, engaging with the um, sport med and the strength and conditioning staff. Um, maybe I don't have to do that every single day, um, but I, I need to make sure that I'm up to speed on any correctives, you know, that I may need to do, um, for my, my physical performance. Cause you, even though I'm talking mental primarily, I mean, you can't, there again, you can't disconnect them. Um, but I'm going to hit up my athletic trainers and my physical therapists. I'm going to get with my strength coaches and I'm just going to do a check-in. Um, hopefully that check-in is going to be beforehand too, even though I'm, you know, I didn't bring that up beforehand, but, um, I'm, I'm going to engage those folks and make sure that I am basically engaging every person on the staff that has the ability to help me, which is pretty much every one of them. And so that's what I'm going to do before I, I leave the gym. So I think that would be a general, generalized prep plan. I think, too, the other thing that I always like to get our guys to do is, you know, after you leave, you know, the gym setting, then, you know, your day obviously continues. And then building, you know, key moments into your day where you can step out and take then like, you know, one to two minutes at a time to engage in some practices where you uh, get into the present moment, engage your diaphragmatic breathing, reset your system, uh, and then go back into whatever you're doing for that day, whether it's even if it's computer work or if you've got some kind of operational training going on, there are still those key moments all the way throughout your day where you can step out and, and condition that parasympathetic response, that rest and digest response to, to help you relax, recover so that you can um, be the most physically and mentally ready to do whatever your next thing is. And that goes back to that energy management concept we just talked about. We did it kind of on the micro level in the gym, but now you're talking a little bit more macro across your day. And if you're just constantly doing that, then eventually the goal is to be able to, to, or to do those things without even thinking about them. Like, I mean, that's the ultimate goal, right? You just get so conditioned to doing them that you no longer think about them. That's just how you go about your, your typical day to day. And because you're doing that, what, what you hope to have happen is for you to there again be able to handle highs and lows a little bit better. Um, and then also once you get to, to uh, go to sleep at night, hopefully you can kind of calm that mental chatter down just a little bit, um, hit that parasympathetic system so you can get to sleep hopefully a little bit faster, sleep a little bit better, and then you know, do a full recovery for the next day. Let's dig into sleep just a little bit more. So the guys are going to come here and sleep becomes – uh, few and far between at times, uh, and when they do finally get to sleep at points, they really need to maximize what short periods of time they get. So what are some techniques they can do to ensure that if they're going to get a few hours of sleep that they can maximize? Yeah, so <clears throat> so we'll take it from the standpoint yeah, that you don't have control over the number, and so now you are just trying to get the best sleep that you can in the short amount of time that you have, right? And so I think this, this comes up in, it came up in OTC a couple weeks ago, and I'm sure it comes up at selection um, during the night when you finally get to go to sleep and you're, you're lying in bed and you've got a truckload of thoughts flying through your head about that day, right? Um, uh, good things, bad things, just a variety of things. And then you know, compile that with everything else, you know, home life, everything is coming together at that point. And then uh, if you think about your very context context specific um, instances. Now you pr you might be doing some visualization in your bed at night uh, to get ready for the next day, right? It may be a performance you know you have coming up, and now you're running through uh, visualization runs in your head. For example, um, I had a guy doing that a couple weeks ago where he was basically going to bed after long training days, and he was having a hard time getting to sleep, but he was doing visualization for the next day. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work, right? And so. When you have that short amount of time, get yourself a good solid, you know, bed routine, right? So if you want to use visualization to uh, review some things from that day, uh, do that in that routine. And what I mean by that is, you know, it might look something like this. You might brush your teeth and then you might uh, get everything you need ready uh, to go to bed, everything set up. Then you might shift to, hey, I'm going to use some visualization and I'm going to clean up some things that I want to clean up from today. Um, and or prepare for tomorrow. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in the bed and then I'm going to shift to my diaphragmatic breathing. 
Uh, the, the great thing about that is when you shift to the diaphragmatic breathing, then you focus your attention on one thing, which is your, your breath rate, which can help you eliminate some of that other chatter. Because if you're focused on one thing, you can't be worried about anything else. And so you've got some uh, attention control going on there, uh, focusing in on one thing. And that one thing is triggering that system that's going to help you uh, sleep just a little bit better and uh, trigger that response to go to sleep in the first place. So that's, that's what I always recommend to guys. Have a routine. And you can employ that routine. It doesn't matter how much sleep you're going to get. You can employ that same routine on modified levels no matter what the situation is. So the guys that you see coming up to selection, what are some of the – a, what are some of the less successful guys? What stands out to you about them? And maybe what are some of the things about the more successful guys um, that you saw that really stood out? Yeah, so the start with the less successful because it's going to then you know tie right into why guys are successful as well. We can do it backwards. But I think less, less successful guys get uh, caught up in uh, negative feedback, um, failure, and um, – social comparison they just they're competing against everybody else and when you combine the uh, potential failures the uh, lack of feedback uh, lack of immediate feedback that you might receive so you don't exactly know how you did um, and the feedback that you did get kind of in the moment didn't seem to be the best but you don't know how you really did overall um, in combination with maybe feeling like man I just didn't perform as well on this task as what I feel like I should have performed uh, because of my experience level or because of maybe what I did in my last training before I got here. Um, and then all on top of that is the competition that's always there between the guys. And uh, I think the, the guys who aren't as successful, the ones who get sucked into uh, the fatal funnel of all of that compounding um, noise, if you will, and, and they, they don't have a system in place to help them stop that. And uh, it gets into, I think it really does get into their heads uh, way more than it does physically. I think, you know, the, the, I think the guys who um, are less successful, it's not from the physical side, I don't believe at all. Um, I, I think it's from the, the mental side that they just don't have some processes in place and some of these compounding factors have just kind of gotten to them. On the flip side, I think the guys who are successful are the ones who remain task focused. You know, they're not as worried um, about uh, everybody else. Um, they're not worried necessarily about the evaluation that's happening. Um, they're just there, and they're going to do what they do. And if it's you know good enough, it's going to be good enough. It's and they're not going to worry about it otherwise. And they're just they're just going to execute their 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 skill sets um, across a, a wide variety of uh, different types of skills. And um, I think uh, also that they're those guys are are really good about um, compartmentalizing and just. You know, if they do struggle an event, they're going to, you know, take it and learn from it and then just move on. But they're not going to let that stay with them uh, for the next uh, particular iteration. For guys who don't get a lot of time with guys like you, I'll tell you, growing up in this community, it seems like we were taught all the way through. And I can't speak for the pipeline now, but I know it's still pervasive out there of, we're grown up to talk to ruminate on our past failures and fix all the weaknesses and not really focus right now. You got to fix what you've messed up yesterday. So as guys, let's just imagine that they somehow realize they're in the fatal funnel because some guys never figure it out. They never do. And that's their demise here. But say a guy just finally figures out, man, this isn't going good. And if I don't do something now, uh, this isn't going to end well. What can they do? What are some basic steps to pull them out? Yeah. So, I think if you're in the moment and you realize that, and what I mean by in the moment is like you're doing a task and you realize it's not going well. So that's a very micro level thing. It's happening right now. I think you can always hit the reset button. Um, there's nothing wrong with even in a task, just taking a quick pause, step back, uh, take that diaphragmatic breath, uh, reset yourself with some kind of hopefully pre-practiced uh, cue or routine to uh, refocus your attention on the most important aspect. And I think that's what some guys fail to do is in a, in a given task, they don't know necessarily what to refocus on because they fail to identify the most important factor at that point in time. So they, they and those guys are usually the ones who are either in their own heads, so they're caught internal and they're, they're overthinking everything, um, and or they are overwhelmed by the external environment, meaning just sensory overload is what it is. And so I think, you know, if you'll 
take that pause, take that breath. It's, it really is a deep breath, but if you do it diaphragmatically, it's going to be a whole lot better as opposed to just a deep breath because that can have a counter effect on you. Um, and then refocus your attention with a pre-planned as much as possible uh, cue that will set yourself up in the present moment on the task at hand on the most important piece of information that's going to basically drive you to your next decision point or to your next uh, execution of whatever skill. So I think that's uh, one thing you can do on the micro level. I think other things you can uh, do if you were to you know, look out just a little bit more broadly. So say you've you know, executed and uh, you've, you've done a, a given task. And now let's say you have, let's just say you have three hours before your next iteration. You got, you got a longer time frame to, to really uh, step back you can ruminate at that point in time. There's nothing wrong with ruminating. It's just making sure you're ruminating and reflecting at the right time. Um, and that you're also doing it in a way that's not going to cause you to overthink everything for the next go around, right? And so, and uh, you know, just a couple suggestions about that. Um, there are plenty of ways to do that, um, but a couple suggestions would be to uh, deal with it, right? So bring it back up, use some visualization, and go back into that failure or that instance and uh, go through it, bring it all back up. And when you're doing that, I always tell people with visualization, most people are not doing it right. And it's a super simple skill that we are all doing. Uh, we're just not all doing it right. Uh, build in um, all of the uh, components that would actually be in existence there. And what I mean by that is anything that you can feel, anything that you can see, anything that you can hear, and uh, bring in the, the activation levels with that too, because you know one thing that happens at selection is guys, they do get anxious at some points in time, and, and that's completely natural. Um, and that's actually okay as long as it helps you perform, but if you know that you're that guy where that's gonna uh, decrease your performance, bring that back up into, into your visualization, bring in those skills, deal with it, clean that repetition up, and now you've got a good rep that you've got in that three hour period instead of that bad rep that's going to follow you and then refocus your attention on to hey all right what what do i know about the next thing coming up um you may not know anything and if that's the case then you uh duties of work whatever it is that you're going to need to do at the time but if you do know something about that next event then you shift to that next event and you go ahead and start preparing yourself for that Back up to something you said, because if I was out there listening and I heard you say it and I didn't understand it, it would be that you said, be careful. I think like one single deep breath may have an opposite effect or a countering yeah. effect. What does that mean? So I've been saying diaphragmatic breath, right? So a, a diaphragmatic breath is one that comes from your diaphragm as, as opposed to um, a chest breath, right? And a lot of times if you if somebody's ever told you, hey, just take a deep breath, right? A lot of times people will take this really big breath where their entire ch chest inflates and it can really kind of cause you to trigger a little bit of exasperation to be honest and it's, it's not really triggering um, anything that's going to help you um, as opposed to a nice honestly easy and it's, it's in some realms it's called effortless breathing a nice easy diaphragmatic breath and that can trigger your parasympathetic system very very easily um, as opposed to just that big, massive deep breath that some sometimes people will take when they, they hear, hey, just take a deep breath and relax. So um, I always tell guys that, you know, honestly, when you're doing diaphragmatic breathing, at a given point in time, I, I'm doing diaphragmatic breathing right now when we're not talking, right? And most of the time, people can't see that, right? And mainly because it's just so easy and effortless that, you know, you don't have to make a big deal of it. Um, and then you can take that and you can when you do your pause and you take that breath, you can do that and people don't even know you're actually taking a deep breath, to be honest, because a lot of guys don't want to be seen taking a deep breath, right? They, they want to be super in control and they don't want to look like anything is going wrong or they are, are currently in the moment out of control. And it's almost like if they you know, take that breath and people see them or they take that pause, then, I, I, and I've talked to guys about this, they feel like they're showing some kind of weakness. And it's not really, it's just, you know, it's kind of a reset and there are ways to do that without even showing that you're really doing it. So. Yeah, ego's a bitch. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it runs our life. Um, there are some guys out there who have no access to a performance psych who are going to come to our selection process. Can you just go over briefly what the parasympathetic and sympathetic responses are? Mm -hmm. Yep, so 
parasympathetic uh, is rest and digest response is the best way to put it. It's just that system that's going to um, help you sleep at night, um, help you digest food, um, those types of things. Um, help you rest, relax, recover. Uh, the sympathetic side, it's more that's that fight, flight, or freeze response, essentially. Um, it's that system that's going to allow us to you know, push a, a car down the road. Um, it's going to be that system that also allows us to do some very hefty mental work as well. So like when we engage, if we're writing a paper or we're reading a book, we're going to have some sympathetic activation there because we've, we're, we're trying to, to do something um, uh, mentally demanding, not necessarily physically demanding. And so uh, those are really the differences between the two systems on a very, you know, just and general What's level. the goal for guys? So as they're going through selection, guys who don't really have a deep understanding of this, obviously the sympathetic is going to come into play a lot. Um What's the goal for the parasympathetic for those guys as they're going through? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just to help you manage your energy levels. That's all it is, right? So I think if you go back to some of those examples, all of that is really devoted to helping you leverage that parasympathetic side um, in moments where you may be sympathetically driven and you don't really have to be, right? And that's not to say that, you know, the sympathetic's bad, so don't don't come away with that. It's just that we don't typically train the parasympathetic side of things nearly as much as frequently as uh, as we do the sympathetic side. And and I think there again mainly because most people don't really know how to train that, and they never thought to train it. So that being said, um, uh, and this is something else to to consider as well as uh, some you know there are you know pieces of biofeedback equipment out there that can help you do that as well. You can do just the diaphragmatic breathing. You can use respiration pacers. There are free apps out there where you can get a, can get a pacer and you can uh, use that as a way to focus your attention and breathe at the, the four to seven breath rate that I was telling you about before. Um, but then there's also some fairly low cost uh, biofeedback equipment that you can purchase that you can then link to your phone and then you can use those to get feedback on your your, your breath rate and your um, heart rate variability and various things that we'll talk more about that we would probably it's, it's a whole different podcast to be honest so yeah i've been as we discussed via text i've been using inner balance lately and that is a challenge because i'm competitive uh, so not only does it frustrate me when i can't be in the green the whole time mm -hmm. um I'm not in the green a lot of the time, and I walk away just wanting to throw that thing in the trash. Right. But then if you open up your mind again and say, look, it's just showing me what I need to work on. And right. uh, I just I use it almost daily now, and it has been a game changer. I think I paid 100 bucks for it, 115 or something like that. But uh, the visual display that it gives you, and it also lets you be a little bit competitive with yourself, it just keeps me addicted to coming sure. back and doing it every day. All right, so I'm going to put you in a situation. Okay. Phase three is just kicked off. You are standing with a very heavy ruck on your back, holding a weapon, mm -hmm. staring down a dark road. It's very early in the morning, and uh, I know I'm about to do a long, heavy walk. <laughs> How do I get my mind right for that? Mm. So I, th I think one thing you just have to realize there is that you know it's coming and just accepting it for what it is. And I've, I've maybe even take me out of this, but I've heard guys with different approaches to this, right? Um, I hear embrace the suck, you know, quite a bit. Um, I've talked to several guys who once they finish selection and then they come into OTC, I'll ask them about that. And they'll say, you know what? I, for me, I just accepted the fact that I was gonna have to do it to actually get here. And you just embrace it. And at some points in time, you actually have to laugh during it. Um, and so I've heard guys taking that strategy, but then I've heard other guys who they, they don't look down the road. They look down the whole time, right? Because when they look down the road, uh, they can't see anything for one. Um, and when they're looking down, then uh, it's almost as if they're, they're right there right now. And so I've heard guys using that approach. Um, there are so many different approaches out there. I've heard guys that use uh, positive self-talk, right? Um, and positive self-talk, this would be positive motivational self-talk. It's just like things like, hey, keep going. You got this, all these other things. That doesn't work for everybody though. Um, I've also heard other guys that are, uh, that'll use goal setting and they'll use more of the short-term goal setting, meaning, hey, I've got this really heavy thing I'm carrying. And if I can uh, make it 10 steps, then I'll put it down, switch, 
10 steps, put it down, and then they're just rotating some just minor goal setting concepts uh, within that just to help them go another 50 yards and then another 50 yards and so on and so forth. And that just allows them to break that, that long uh, event up into more digestible chunks. Um, and then um, I know that uh, guys definitely, when they do have breaks, um, if they if they do get breaks, then they will make the most of those breaks as possible. Like they'll do something, they'll get something in their system, uh, nutrition wise, to help them. Uh, they'll rehydrate. Um, they'll stay hydrated throughout anyway. And uh, so, man, there's so many different ways uh, to skin that cat. To be honest, so if you could see in the mind of the guy who is not healthy mentally as that event's about to kick off, what does that look like? Probably a guy who is is stuck on everything that's happened beforehand, and he he's he's really probably stuck on the failures. To be honest, like he's failed a few times before he gets to that, and those failures have kind of gone back to the idea of, of, of the compounding, uh, the getting into the fatal funnel we were talking about before, and now mentally he's focused on the failures, the lack of feedback, and the competition with others and feeling like he's not maybe meant to be there. And then all of a sudden he's looking down a road and he can't see anything and he, it's the, the rock is extremely heavy and it's like, okay, that's, that's what I would assume I would see if you were to look in that guy's mind. I will give a own personal example of some of the things you're talking about. Uh, I haven't mentioned this on this podcast, but everybody around me, I talk about the Appalachian Trail a lot. I just walked the whole thing a couple of years ago and trying to figure out when you are taking your first step on a 2,189.8 mile journey, you don't know what to focus on. It's, it seems ridiculous to focus on the next step because it's, you got 2,100 miles to go. It seems ridiculous to focus on Mount Katahdin, which is um, a very long way away too. So it took me a long time to figure out where is that balance in between? What am I gonna focus on right now in the moment? What are my daily goals? What are my weekly goals? But once you sort it out, life becomes clear. But the worst part about it is when you cross a freaking mileage sign that somebody threw out that says Katahdin 2,100 miles to go. That <laughs> disrupts everything that you've done up to that point. You're like, man, I've been out here for a month and I've still got 1,800 miles to go. So anyway, the whole reason I told that story is that you got to figure out what those goals are for you in those moments and then just reinforce those goals. Yeah. And that kind of struck a, another one, too. And, and I, I think Barb might have mentioned this on the podcast as well. But uh, Barb is big into purpose, you know, having a purpose before you get here, developing that purpose deep down. And then that's going to help drive uh, better goal setting in and, and the moment, motivation, all these other things that have kind of come up in, in some of these conversations. But um, I'll give you an example. I know that there's a guy right now that I talk to. Um, and he was telling me that on the rock, uh, back to purpose, obviously he wanted to be there, but then when you really develop that purpose and then you kind of break some of the underlying factors down, you know, one of the things he kept visualizing throughout was the conversation he was going to have to have with his wife when he got back. Right. And so that doesn't necessarily work for everything, but everybody, but that worked for, for him, um, to keep him going. Right. Um, and I've heard other guys say similar types of things. They might not have used their wives. It might have been somebody else, or it might be some guys they already know that are here that they, you know, you know, didn't want to necessarily disappoint, or that they just really wanted to be with. If you were to take it and flip it from disappointment to, hey, I want to do this because. And so, as I said, we we could throw out for every single guy, we could probably throw out a different strategy that they used to to get through that. Um, and it, it's. It's never going to be the, the it's never going to be easy, and there's never going to be an exact way to do that. And I think at a given point in time, too, um, one of the best things to do is just to put your head down and go. Right? You just go. <laughs> and so as as bad as that sounds in terms of advice, I mean, it's just a it's a grueling event. All right, Ben. Before we close this out, I just want to offer it up to you. Any other concepts about selection or anything that we didn't cover that you think would be beneficial for the guys? Can't think of anything. I, I would go to the website though, um, and I'll try to post some some more things. I've got some. I didn't mention some podcasts, mm. and I've got some good podcasts. Yeah, please, please yeah. mention those. Um, I did the other, the kind of the general preparation. When I mentioned the reading, 
Uh, if, if you've got a drive ahead of you every day to work, then podcasts are great things to be doing. I've got a few um, that I'll put out, 90% Mental, uh, Finding Mastery, Elite HRV, uh, Nourish, Balance, Thrive, and then uh, there's one I listened to this morning, Optimal Performance Podcast. All of those podcasts have some, some really good uh, sessions uh, devoted to uh, the mental side of things, and uh, uh, they'll hit on a lot of those things that you'll, that you'll get out of those books as well. So if you're the guy that likes to listen uh, to something instead of reading it, then, then go to those podcasts. That'll be a good starting point for you. All right, folks, I hope you got as much out of this as I think you did, because I got a lot out of it just sitting in here with Dr. Wellborn. Um, But appreciate you guys for tuning in. Ben, I appreciate you sitting through this. Uh, Absolutely. My pleasure. All right, folks, we will see you next time on the Insight Through Experience podcast. Thanks for joining us.